Hello everybody. I'll start with a very simple exercise. Just imagine you are sitting right next to this lake and we are doing a deep breathing exercise. Inhale, exhale. The person sitting next to you should be able to hear you breathing. In inhale, exhale. Keep on doing, keep on doing. The person sitting next to you should be able to hear you breathing. Keep on breathing, keep on breathing. Inhale, exhale. Okay, let's stop this exercise. But please keep on breathing. I don't want dead people coming after my talk that you told us not to breathe. So exercise is done. This is what I'm creating was the most deadliest air what we breathe now in India. These were some of the air pollutants. And I've heard that people in the front have paid the most, so they should experience the most. So you will not only know about air pollution, but you will, by the end of talk, feel about air pollution. So this is nothing new, right? So we do this air breathing every day. And in North India, we are breathing the world's deadliest air. Delhi is the most polluted capital in the world. Gurgaon is the most polluted city in the world. Out of the top 15 world's most polluted cities in the world. I'm not very comfortable to say that, but we have 14 of those cities right in India. That's the kind of air we are breathing every day. So this is a stat which shows that 44 cigarettes per day we are smoking if we are staying in the national capital region. So we can easily say that, okay, you know, we are grown-ups. It is still, we can take that impact. But what about this? Right? So what about our kids? breathing the same air. Right? We have to think about our upcoming generation, what is the impact we are uh, having on them by the air pollutants, which we are doing, polluting the air every day. So 1.2 million people in India die annually just because of air pollution. Globally, 4.2 million, but we have a very large share, giant share of that particular percentage of 1.2 million people dying every year just from air pollution. But have you heard anybody saying that my relative died because of air pollution or a doctor saying that uh, you no know, person is no more, he died because of air pollution? The reason is that air pollution causes your other organs to fail. It can cause cancer, it can cause your heart to fail, it can cause your brain to fail and then it can go to all your bloodstream and cause other organs to fail. So that is the kind of impact it's having on our day-to-day -day life. So you can see the amount of air pollutants which has gone into the lungs. This is not like a, a water filter which you can change. If your lungs are, uh, the air pollutants have gone into your lungs, it can't be cleaned, then you are, uh, saying sorry, it's, it's done. So then you're done for the life. And globally, 28% of the cases for lung cancer now are people who have never smoked in their life. So that is the amount of cancer it is causing. But in India, again, we are, we are topping the charts. This is one of the statements from one of the leading hospitals in Delhi that almost 50% of the cases of, ear, uh, of lung cancer are coming from the people who have never smoked in their life. So they, they don't smoke, they don't smoke cigarettes, but 50% of them are having lung cancer. So one of, so these kind of pictures are there now on cigarettes, right? So you, people who smoke or have seen the boxes, but my guess is now we should have it everywhere. It, it's a national emergency now. We should have these kind of pictures everywhere. What is basically an air pollutant? Air pollutant, you can see the big round, circle, that is the width of a human hair. The smaller circles are basically the air pollutants, what I just kept it here. So these are, it's, it's called particulate matter, it goes into the nose, the one is PM10, PM2.5, so these are the things you will read, read about also 
in newspaper articles that they are in infected by PM10 or PM2.5. So they are referring to the width of the air pollutants. So let's see what it causes or how it goes inside our body. So the bigger picture of the hair is that much the width and the smaller ones are the air pollutants. PM10, which is still a large air, air pollutant, gets blocked by a nose. So our, our body is still designed in such a way that even PM10, which is the circle below the, the hair, can be still blocked by our nose. But what happens if the air pollutants are even smaller? Air pollutants which are even smaller, PM2.5 goes into your lungs, gets into your capillaries, your, uh, where the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen happens. So those are get blocked and ultimately deposit here and the cancer starts. Even if it's PM less than PM2.5, then the problem is much, much bigger. The air pollutant actually goes into your bloodstream and crosses and goes to every part of your body. It goes to your brain, it goes to your heart. That is the stage I say you know, we are in the stage of nirvana that we have, we have been polluted so much now that even God can't save us. PM10 can be blocked, as I said, can be blocked in the nose. So that's also a code word I use that if one of the kids in a family is, is picking their nose in a family function, I j just tell them, please don't take out PM10s right now. But this is the impact of the full human body. Let's see what impact we have done on the growing child inside a mother. Now, scientists and researchers have found out that these black carbon particles are deposited now in placenta, which is basically giving nutrients to the growing human baby in the womb. That is, that at that place also, now carbon particles are being found out and it causes miscarriages, it causes premature deaths. Even if the, the baby was strong enough to take that impact, if it, it, it comes out as, as a normal baby from the outside, but the brain has been impacted so much that it will never match an IQ level of a normal baby. So you, we can keep on teaching our kids two into two is four and four into two is eight, but if that impact has already happened inside the, uh, the woman's womb, no, nothing can be undone after that. So that was, that's the problem right now. And one of the major problems cited about the whole air pollutants in North India is that farmers burn the paddy straw, right? So that's 30 million tons of paddy straw is produced every year, what to do with that? Seeing from a farmer's point of view, this is the amount of three tons of paddy straw is taken out of one acre. So there is no solution to it. Farmer says, you tell us what is the solution, we will do that. But as on today, there's no solution to it. So farmer, what it does for the next cropping cycle, he burns the paddy straw. That emits a lot of carbon particles, uh, which goes into the atmosphere. As a government or as a, as a society, we said that put fines on farmers. So we started putting a lot of fines on the farmers. What it, what it does is, 3,000, more than 3,000 deaths of farmers just because of their economic breakdown. If we put, start putting more fines on them, so there will be more farmer suicides. Is that the solution we want? I guess no. Society, as a society, those are our, our bread, uh, bread producers of our society. We want more suicides happening in that threat of our society? No. The another solution which was talked about was put the next cropping cycle within the standing straw. It impacts the productivity in the next cropping cycle. Farmers don't like that. Who wants their productivity uh, to go down? This is how you can see the, the straw is still standing there, but the next crop is coming up, but it is impacting the productivity. The other problem is a lot more pest attacks. So this year, farmers also think about these things, about air pollution. 2,500 acres was not burned and farmers used uh, the same straw and the next crop was put up in the same field. 2,500 acres were eaten by uh, these particular ants because the wet, crop, wet straw from the previous thing was still there and 2,500 acres was gone. And then there are more farmer suicides. So it kept me thinking, right? So what is the solution? Um, I, I was um, leaving my kids to school, Rajbin and Sataj, small kids. They're sitting here. Uh, the, the younger kid asked me, uh, Papa, do you know what's, what's, why, bullet train goes so fast and it still doesn't create ripples. So I said, I don't know about that. He told me that very interesting thing that 
it is because the first model which was made caused a lot of ripples. Then the Japanese bullet train, they designed the bullet train on the design of Kingfisher uh, Peak because it goes from air to water without creating ripples. That is how the nose of the, uh, the bullet train was designed. So this was the first design of the bullet train. It was made so that it can cross the air, but it was causing a lot of ripples and sound impact was there. So then these were the further designs of, uh, it was completely mimicked off to the beak of the Kingfisher and the final version was very good that it was never creating any ripples. So I studied more about this that what is this all science about? I learned, discovered or learned two major things. That's as human beings, we love to copy and basically we are lazy beings. So nature is a great storyteller is a great teacher. Only thing is we have to see it with our open minds. So then I asked my kids, I thought, you know, kids are giving me good ideas. Let me ask that, do you know how the biomass or, you know, dinosaurs were there? What happened to those dinosaurs and forests? Where, where have they gone and how has nature created or, or buried them without any creating pollutions? And where we are getting our fossil fuels from? They told me we are get, getting gas from these dinosaurs and coal from also these dinosaurs. They were not very exactly right about this time, but it gave me some idea that this is how nature actually managed the forests and the animals which were there. So it created, it buried these biomass into uh, the earth and after high pressure, high temperature, no oxygen, it gave us biofuels. I started working with Aston University, UK, European Bioenergy Research Institute and Oglisby Charitable Trust, three entities in UK, that let's come together and find solutions for that. So these are the best institutes all around the world which are working on bioenergy. The idea was clear that if nature is producing, burying the biomass into the ground and producing biofuels without causing any pollutions, why we are burning it every day, these biomass, which is extra. So we. This is basically the biomimicry part of it. So we learn from nature, we are lazy beings, we learn from nature and this is how nature has done it. These were our initial designs that we were able to produce, copy what nature has done for million years. We are doing this in laboratories in quicker time. So within one hour we are able to convert, let's say a ton of biomass into coal, oil and vapor. And this was our initial design, you can see this is the gas which is coming out from the biomass. So this was the reactor which we designed, which created the same kind of environment, high pressure, high temperature, no oxygen, gave us biofuels. And boom, we created coal, oil and gas out of that. So we were really amazed that, okay, there is some solution to it. The next stage was testing those biofuels. So when we created coal out of paddy straw, we worked with some of the bigger industries, bigger brand names and fired that in, in the, their boilers. It worked very well. So these were the initial days when we were testing uh, our coal. It left us with two big problems. One was the, the coal which we were producing was causing a lot of clinker formation, which is hard stones in the boilers. And second big problem was when we started collecting straw, because of rains, it started getting degenerated. So on one hand, we had this problem of clinker formation, which is hard stones. And on second thing was how to store this biomass without getting affected from the rain. Again, getting back to the nature. So this, the science, which is called biomimicry, if the nature, which is making coal without having the properties of clinker formation, how do we make biofuels from the waste biomass without that particular clinker formation? Then I studied more about that. So there were certain experiments which has been done in Europe about removing clinker. They were saying that's one of the processes called leaching. I studied more about leaching. Leaching is nothing but washing your biomass in the rains or the open water. Here on one side, we were worrying about the rains getting impacted, uh, the, our biomass getting impacted because of rain. And second night, we had more ash problem. So the research mentioned that when the biomass is washed by the rain water, it reduces the ash percentage in the boilers. So boom, we had both our solutions. We didn't have to cover our biomass, left it open in the rains. It leached the clinker formation properties and we got a biomass, which was easy to use now in boilers. So this is our nature 
inspired solutions for that. So now, this is the kind of operations we do. We cover more than close to 4,000 acres. Uh, the biofuels which we make, we give it to bigger brand names. We have given to Pepsi, Unilever. They are able to replace the normal coal and wood from the, the coal or the pellets, what we made from waste biomass, and help the farmers on the other hand by buying their biomass. So it's an additional livelihood uh, income generation for farmers. Second is we are able to replace the fossil fuels which are coming, let's suppose, from Jharkhand, mine from Jharkhand coming all the way to Punjab. The next step what we have done is going up to electricity generation. So let's suppose a village which has a thousand acres of land producing a lot of biomass. We can give them biofuels which are coal and coal or oil, but what do a normal villager do with coal and oil? Most of the villages already have electricity and gas. So now we are putting up decentralized electricity generation. Biomass gets collected there, smaller grid in a village produces electricity, powers a village. Farmers earn from selling their biomass. We are able to uh, put a parallel line to the grid electricity and match the grid cost. And if we are able to do this in all the villages in Punjab, boom, the problem of biomass is gone, farmers earn more, and we have a direct source of electricity, a reliable source of electricity. This is what our future should look like. Enjoying the nature, enjoying good nature, good air. This is my kids enjoying in, in Mumbai a few days back, but we don't want this. So we should be all responsible citizens asking a questions that where the power which we are using is coming from. Is it coming from coal power plants, which are giving a lot of pollution? And what are the solutions which are, which are problems like straw burning or any problem which we are facing right now? So as I said, get inspired from nature. Solutions are all around us. Just get inspired from the nature and find solutions for that. And yes, learn from your kids. They can teach you a lot. And this was not a pollutant, this was just a normal powder, so be happy about that. Thank you.